thank you for joining the guest neurologist session. All participants are muted. And if you are having any technical, technical difficulties, we recommend disconnecting from the webinar and reconnecting. If you continue to have technical difficulties, send a message through the chat feature and we will try to assist you. Questions must be asked in the Q&A feature through Zoom, not the chat. When your question is up, we will allow you to turn on your video and ask it live. Otherwise, if you do not wish to go on video, we will simply read it from the Q&A feature. I'm pleased to introduce our panel members for today. Our host is Dr. Jose Torres. Our guest neurologist is Dr. Ariel Kurzweil, and our student moderator is Panina Krieger. Dr. Torres, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Allison. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us uh, for the American Academy of Neurology's guest neurologist session. Um, my name is Jose Torres, and I'm a neurologist at NYU Langone Health System. I'm a stroke neurologist, um, originally from the Dominican Republic. And uh, I guess a fun fact about myself is that I uh, love tennis and I love to travel. And I recently went to uh, Croatia. Um, so for all of you who uh, are thinking about doing neurology, our quality of life is, is awesome. So that's one thing to look forward to. Um, this initiative comes out of the AEN's pipeline subcommittee, and its mission is to bring neurology and the neurosciences to students of all ages. Um, the guest neurology session targets various states and hopes to allow for a lot of uh, different connections. And today we're focusing on the state of New York. The first 15 minutes of the program will be our medical student moderator interviewing our guest neurologist. And from there, the rest of the time will be for you to ask any questions of the guest neurologist or medical student. So um, please utilize the Q&A feature for this. Once your question is chosen to be asked, we will announce uh, and allow you to ask it um, live. Uh, I'm excited to introduce today our uh, guest neurologist, Dr. Ariel Kurzweil. Uh, who is one of my colleagues uh, and a great friend, um, and uh, the future Dr. Pamina Krieger, who is our uh, medical student moderator. Uh, Dr. Kurzweil um, has two incredible jobs. Uh, she evaluates and cares for patients with neurologic uh, problems in an office setting, um, and she leads our uh, neurology residency program, um, which uh, you know, under her leadership has become one of the best uh, in the country, I should say. Um, and she helps our residents become great neurologists. Um, and her interests include providing holistic care for her patients, um, exploring innovative ways to teach neurologists, um, the neurologists of the future, uh, and does education research. Um, and a fun fact about Dr. Kurzweil is that once upon a time, she was a bat, she played badminton uh, competitively. Um, our medical student moderator is Panina Krieger, uh, and she is a fourth year medical student. Um, Panina um, is here at the NYU uh, School of Medicine uh, and is applying to neurology residency. She is a graduate from Cambridge University. Um, she did a um, master's of philosophy in the biological sciences uh, and also graduated from Princeton University with a BA in neuroscience and she lives in New York with uh, her husband and two rescue dogs. Um, and uh, again, as a reminder, please submit any questions via the Q&A box. Uh, and with that, I will hand it over uh, to Panina. Great, thank you. Um, so for this first part, I'm gonna um, ask Dr. Kurzweil some questions that'll hopefully um, get us started in our conversation. So um, Dr. Kurzweil, I think to start, can you just talk about how you trained to become a neurologist? Sure, thanks for the question, Panina, and thanks so much to the AAN for having us today. Um, and thank you guys for all joining us. So to answer Panina's question, you know, to become a neurologist, it, it takes a lot of training, a lot of work. Um, you go to four years of undergraduate, which a lot of you may be in that position right now, um, depending upon where you are in the world. If you're in the U.S., it's four years of undergraduate, followed by four years of medical school, again, in the U.S., um, followed by residency training after that. And there are different training programs, uh, whether you want to become an adult neurologist or a child neurologist. For an adult neurology residency training program beyond medical school, you do one year of internal medicine training and three years of adult neurology training. 
If you're interested in pediatric neurology, it's its own separate residency training program where you do two years of general pediatrics followed by one year of adult neurology and then followed by two years of pediatric neurology. After that, if you're interested in kind of subspecializing in neurology, um, you could do an additional year or two to further develop skills within an, a certain area of neurology. So as an example, after neurology residency training, you might pursue a year in vascular neurology or stroke. That's what Dr. Torres does. You might do a year of neurophysiology and really study the electricity of the nervous system through seizure disorders and nerve problems. Um, that's what I did. Um, you might go into something like multiple sclerosis or headache medicine. Um, and then there are plenty of jobs for general neurologists. And in my practice. I'm a general neurologist and see patients with all kinds of general neurologic problems. Great, thank you. Um, you kind of brought this up, but um, something I really appreciate about neurology is the breadth of the field. So if you could kind of talk about what are some of the disorders that neurologists treat? Sure. So, you know, as a general neurologist, um, which is something that I love, I get to see a little bit of everything. And we really take care of the medical aspects of neurologic disease. So just as an aside, because I know a lot of people here on the on the uh, line today and on the panel um, discussion might be interested just in neurosciences in general or neurology in general, a different pathway would be neurosurgery. And that's its own residency training program. But as a neurologist, we really take care of all the kind of medical aspects of neurologic disease. Disease. So examples of that would be patients, for instance, like I saw this morning, um, and on my panel of patients, I saw a patient with migraine headaches. I saw another patient with Parkinson's disease. I saw another patient with seizure disorders and had to manage them with medications. Um, I saw another patient who had tingling on his face and a new rash, and it actually, I think it ended up being shingles. Um, and so we really see a wide gamut of diseases within uh, neurology, and like I said, can kind of focus on those broad disorders or really kind of be more focused in your practice. Thank you. Um, and what do you think kind of sets neurology apart from other areas within medicine? Sure. So, you know, going through uh, medical school, I really thought that I may pursue multiple different fields. I loved internal medicine when I was on that clerkship. I loved working with children on pediatrics. Um, I didn't love being in the OR, so surgery was never a major consideration. But my point is that I really like different areas in medicine. And then when I got to neurology, and I thought about the topics that have interested me throughout kind of my, my schooling and my training, which was the brain and the mind and things like that, when I got to see how that plays out in action, seeing how a neurologic exam can really help you localize a problem in the nervous system, just by doing an exam, you could say, aha, the problem's here. Um, I found that kind of magical and really incredible, and it hooked me, and I didn't find that in other fields of medicine, um, that you rely so heavily on the art of the history and exam. Um, and I really fell in love with neurology after that. And uh, it's really an incredible field that allows you to really rely on that history and exam and then allows you to collaborate and really talk about these cases. Some of them become mystery cases and zebra cases and really talk about them with your colleagues and collaborate as a team. Thank you. Um, so we kind of touched on this, but um, I know that neurologists have very different days um, in terms of what they see um, and the structure of their day. Can you kind of describe what a day in your life kind of looks like? Sure. So, you know, as a general neurologist, my job is mostly in an office setting. Um, and that might be different from, for instance, Dr. Torres's job, where he spends a lot of his time seeing patients in a hospital setting uh, because he evaluates patients with acute strokes. So my day might look a little bit different. Um, and as Dr. Torres mentioned in the introduction, I also have kind of two jobs within my larger job as a neurologist. Part of my job is seeing patients with neurologic disorders. And then part of my job is training the neurologists of the future um, and running a residency training program at NYU. So 
I'll give you an example of what a day to day looks like my day today. Um, I woke up I had, um, I went to the office and had a meeting from eight to 9am. Um, and there and we, we often have various types of meetings, we have different committees that help run our department, and are focused on things like quality improvement or wellness within the department or teleneurology. Um, sometimes we have a didactic that I give or attend with our residents like a lecture. Um, so that usually happens eight to nine. And then I started seeing patients today at nine o'clock and I finished around two or two 30. Um, that's the way I had made my schedule. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the patients all had very varying kind of neurologic issues. So I saw a patient with migraines and one with seizures, one with a movement disorder, um, one with tingling and numbness that probably was related to an infection. Um, but I had another patient with neuropathy, a problem with the, the peripheral nerves. So I saw that kind of conglomeration of patients. And then thereafter, I spend time meeting with residents and talking about their career plans and their career goals um, and doing various activities with the residents. Like I mentioned, sometimes I do didactics. Uh, yesterday, I led um, sessions for our medical students actually in our simulation center. Um, and now I'm happy to talk to all of you uh, about the world of neurology, which excites me. Great. Um... Can you kind of describe how you came to neurology? Was it something you always knew you wanted to do? Was it something that was a particular experience that inspired you? So I, I think that um, behavior and human connection and human interactions have always really interested me and fascinated me. And I, I studied a lot of psychology in undergraduate, um, but also a lot of neurology. And, you know, like I mentioned, I think that kind of came to life for me in medical school in studying the sciences behind brain and behavior, then applying that um, to patient care was incredible because I got to interact with humans and learn from them about both them as human beings, but then also them and the disorders that they have, um, and then and then try to heal and and cure them if possible. So. Um, you know, I think that it was really just neurology coming to life in medical school that really kind of grabbed me. Um, and, you know, then once that I was in residency training, I loved all of neurology and didn't want to give it up. And so that's ultimately why I chose the field of general neurology. Um, and I, I would say the one other very, very important factor in me going into neurology and really encouraging me on that pathway was mentorship. Um, and I think when people are going throughout their training in high school, in college, at the medical student, uh, medical school level and beyond, um, oftentimes it's those kind of roles of mentors that really kind of set you on one path or another. And when I was in medical school, I had incredible mentors in neurology, um, the residents and faculty who I looked up to and said, hey, I really wanna do what they're doing one day. That looks incredible. I love the patient relationships that they're forming. I love these thinking about these disorders and where they are in the nervous system system and how we can treat them. Um, so I would say that's another big aspect that really got me into the field. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when you're going to work, what is kind of excites you continuously about neurology? Like what continues to drive your passion for it? So I think the main you know, the main driver of my excitement every day is that it is never dull and I am always meeting new people. So every patient that I meet is either a patient that I've already developed a relationship with and I really enjoy seeing them again and kind of working alongside with them, um, kind of along their journey with neurologic disease, but just also as a person that I end up you know, learning to care about a lot. Um, but I also see new patients mixed in with that every day. And it isn't in a lot of jobs that you could say you meet you meet new people on a daily basis and develop meaningful relationships with those people. And I think really medicine and neurology in particular really affords that opportunity. Um, and it excites me, it's amazing. Um, and I also really just get enthusiastic about the subject matter. So I love talking about it with students, with residents, um, kind of giving them my love of the neurologic exam and teaching that um, and teaching kind of all the tricks and the magic that that exam can kind of bring to life um, is, is really fun. So I get to kind of combine all those loves on my day-to-day -day job. All right, um, and just a quick last question. Um, is there anything that, any advice you would give to college students who think they might be interested in neurology, anything kind of you wish you had 
thought about or been told when you were at their stage? So I would say a few things. One is that I think um, the field of medicine in general is really, really rewarding. Um, and that if you love the exploratory nature of medicine um, and you think, oh, I love neuroscience, maybe I'll be a neuroscience researcher. If you love being with people and meeting people and forming those connections, I would just encourage people to then further explore how to tie in neuroscience with treating patients. Um, because I think that's the magic of, of neurology and, and a career as a physician. Um, so, you know, I'd encourage people to kind of explore that connection, um, but I'd also uh, encourage people to kind of go into medical school with a very open mind. Um, and although I think neurology is by far and away the best field, and I don't regret for a day that that's the, the field that I chose, um, I do think it was really good going through medical school with an open mind and saying, is there anything else that I would love as much? Um, and, uh, and is this really what I could see myself doing every day? Because sometimes there's more than one thing that you, the, you, you might love. And so I think it's good to keep your mind open. Um, and in the end, neurology is still the best field. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I think now we're going to move on to taking questions, um, that people have written. I'll pass it on to Dr. Torres. Thank you, Panina. Uh, and thank you, Ariel, for answering some of those questions already. But we have some more uh, from uh, the students that have joined. Um, one of them is from an anonymous attendee. And this person says, I'm a biology undergrad student on my, on my third year and also a mom for a three-year-old. I often found difficulties to balance between my school and life. Uh, and I found it hard to be involved in extracurricular activities or even volunteering. My question is, do you think being involved in uh, during undergrad is crucial for med school acceptance? So thanks for that question. Um, and uh, I totally hear you on work-life balance as uh, a mom in, in the field of medicine being difficult. Um, I have two children, they're younger children, um, and it's definitely a challenge, um, but really also a privilege to be able to do incredible things that I love, both my work as a neurologist and, and being a mom to two awesome girls. Um, so I would, I would say that that should not deter you in pursuing your career goals. And I would also say that, you know, you have to pick and choose a little bit more probably when you're in that position. So as an undergraduate, especially, you know, if that's the stage that you're in, you might not be able to do all the activities that you want. But what I would advise you to do is pick one or two, pick the ones that you're most passionate about, not the ones that you think would look good on an application, but let your passion shine and whatever you really feel excited about, do that, um, pursue that as maybe a, an extracurricular and it might only be one that you have time for. Um, and your passion for it will show through in the level of dedication you're able to give to it and the fact that you're doing it despite the fact that you also have these other kind of life responsibilities. Um, and I think that the number of activities you do is not as important as kind of the passion and the dedication you have for it. So I would say maybe pick one and, and kind of go for it. Um, I would add, there are many people in my class who actually have children or have other kind of family commitments um, generally, they, they're they just as successful as any of us. I think they, as Dr. Kurzweil say, said, um, kind of learn to prioritize kind of what they want to be involved in. And so they might not be involved in as many things, but the things they are involved in, they're passionate about, um, and they make a difference in them. And I think that is, um, at this point, what's important. We have two related questions um, regarding research and uh, neurology. Um, so one question is, you know, do you or any of your colleagues do research and what does that look like? And if you're going to pursue research, uh, whether uh, you should pursue it via a PhD or whether you can do clinical and, uh, or you can do research during residency or during your clinical uh, responsibility. Yeah, it's a great question. So I'll speak and then I'll let, you know, Panina answer for any kind of research she's done as a student. Um, 
I, you know, I'm, uh, my, my practice is mostly focused on being a clinician and an educator. And so the research that I do is mostly centered around education research. So that's basically looking at the ways that we are able to train our doctors and our neurologists and try to make those better. Um, and what's the data behind them? What works to help train people? And what are innovative ways we can do that? So that's what my research centers on. And so I devote most of my time really to seeing patients and working with residents, but that research is kind of goes along Side my kind of educator hat. Um, there are a lot of other colleagues of mine in our department who really pursue research within a different subspecialty. So, you know, we I have colleagues that do um, research in something called small fiber neuropathy. You know, there she's also a general neurologist and then has a dedicated day of the week. That's her research time, and she really pursues project um, and does more more clinical based research in in neuropathy. Um, and we have people who enroll patients in clinical trials, they spend part of their time taking care of patients, for instance, with multiple sclerosis. And then the other part of the time, they're um, enrolling patients in clinical trials to study different drugs um, that could be used to treat multiple sclerosis and so forth. And, and kind of the list goes on. I mean, we also have colleagues who um, might spend most of their time in a lab. So as an example, Dr. Wisniewski is one of our Alzheimer's doctors who really concentrates his clinical practice in a day and a half of taking care of patients with cognitive problems, memory problems, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then the rest of his time, he actually runs a laboratory at NYU and does basic science research in uh, memory disorders and prion diseases, which is another form of a, a disease that causes memory dysfunction. So your job can really look different depending upon how you you crafted. And I think, you know, as Panina mentioned earlier, neurology is such a wonderful field because it doesn't look the same for every neurologist. It really can be crafted depending upon, do you want to just take care of patients? Do you want to incorporate research into your career? Do you want to be an educator? Um, and, and you really can have the flexibility to do all that, mostly in an academic setting. Um, when you go out to the community and you treat patients, of course, ultimately you can craft your practice how you want. Um, but I think that people in a community setting um, usually are more focused on taking care of patients or maybe like an administrative role in the AAN, for instance, something like that. Yeah, um, I think there, I was actually surprised coming to medical school how much opportunity there is for research. Um, I took a year off and did a master's because I was interested in research and wanted that experience. A lot of people who feel like they want more research time either do it during a gap year or take a year off um, after their third year of medical school. Um, and that's always an option. I would say, um, I feel like I've gotten a lot of mentoring from a, a lot of amazing clinicians and researchers who uh, do devote their time to both their patients and also furthering care through research. Um, personally, I find that you know, seeing the patients, taking care of the patients, and then doing the research that will ultimately impact how you make decisions in the future about their care makes it all much more meaningful. Um, and I think it kind of melds very well, um, the research and the clinical part. Um, and I find also like within clinical settings, people are very um, happy to mentor um, in terms of research. There's honestly, like endless opportunities I found um, to kind of find your niche of what you're interested in and kind of devote yourself to it. There's also times during medical school that you can, you know, take an elective or a month off and kind of devote yourself to research um, in different ways. And different schools have different ways of doing that. But most of them have some way that you can kind of work research into your curriculum. So if that's something that interests you, there definitely is time within medical school to take part in research. I think Mitchell has a question about uh, neurology and psychiatry. Okay, Mitchell, if you wanted to ask the question yourself, you are more than welcome to. Otherwise, we can say it for you. Okay, Dr. Torres. Sure. So um, Mitchell asked, uh, can you discuss the connections between neurology and psychiatry um, and the overlap and interactions 
that you have um, with psychiatrists and the illnesses they treat. Sure, so I th that's actually a great question because um, when you think about neurology and the organ it's associated with and psychiatry and the organ it's associated with, it's the same. And so the question is like, how do we differentiate ourselves? And it's really a spectrum of illness. I mean, it's I, some people um, even think that maybe that kind of training should be together. And in fact, neurologists um, are required to do training within psychiatry in their three years of neurology training and vice versa. Psychiatry residents are required to do um, a certain period of time in neurology on their training. And the neurology boards and psychiatry boards have questions about the other fields um, on their board. So it's the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, the ABPN, that lets us sit for those boards. They're combined. Um, and so there, you know, it's really difficult to kind of dissemble a neurologic illness from a psychiatric one, and there's a huge amount of overlap. And, and so I think as a neurologist, you really just need to appreciate that psychiatric illness can be a comorbidity with neurologic diseases, meaning that you see psychiatric illness sometimes more frequently, depending upon the diagnosis in neurology. Um, and what seems to be psychiatric disease sometimes ends up being neurologic. So, you know, there are diseases of inflammation of the brain that present initially with like psychotic features, like someone's hallucinating or someone is really acting differently than how they usually act. Um, and it ends up being a neurologic problem, neurologic, I would say, um, rather than a pure psychiatric one. And so I think it's really hard to kind of divorce one from the other. And we really, you know, as neurolo as good neurologists, we really kind of take into consideration the holistic overlap of psych and neuro. So like I said, you'll train in psychiatry even as a neurologist. And as a general neurologist, I see a ton of psychiatry in my practice. And, and I make sure that that's a huge part of my review of systems that I'm really attending to mood and, and other kind of features of psychiatric illness, even when I'm taking a, um, a history for neurologic problems. Yeah, um, I can add to that. Um, I do think it's somewhat confusing. I remember being confused about the separation myself, um, given that, as Dr. Kurzweil said, the organ is kind of the same. Um, I think what I personally like about neurology is what Dr. Kurzweil said is there's a lot of um, kind of the personal connection and thinking about also, you know, psychiatric issues, mood, things like that. Um, I think that something that's kind of unique about neurology is you can't really like divorce yourself from your brain, you know, like, um, and so disorders of neurology are often very, you know, change people's identity, really affect people in very different ways. And so I think that that's one of the parts of neurology that can, can be very rewarding as well. Next, Shai has a question regarding the connection between neurosurgery and neuroscience and technology. We can have him uh, or, or her ask the question. Uh, hey guys, thanks. Uh, so my question would be, how do you guys see the neuroscience career in the technological field, such as working in companies like Neuralink or starting my own business, for example? So I think, you know, it, it, that's, it's a good question. And I think a lot of people within the medical field have this interest in technology and how we could bring technology to kind of different, you know, devices for treatment and, or even diagnosis first and then treatment. Um, and so I, I don't, you know, I think that that's not a totally uncommon shared interest. Um, it's not one that I've pursued. So I don't know a whole lot about kind of like incorporating the field of technology into practice, um, but as an example, in some ways that people have that I know are in our department, one example would be someone in our movement disorders department, for instance, who I think was probably also torn between the fields of neurology and neurosurgery um, and ended up treating patients with movement disorders and worked closely and became a neurologist, but worked very closely with the neurosurgeons to plant deep brain stimulators you know, into the brain to control tremors and Parkinson's disease, and then worked as a neurologist alongside them to make sure that they were programmed appropriately and then further adjusted appropriately at subsequent visits and things like that. Um, so that's one example of someone who I think also had a real passion for technology and incorporated it into neurology, but worked very closely alongside neurosurgeons 
to take care of patients. Um, you know, as another example, we have neurologists in the fields of multiple sclerosis. They're investigating like um, something called TMS, which is a stimulator, um, a technological device that might help treat symptoms and help with ambulation in, in different disorders, including multiple sclerosis. Um, and so as part of research as a neurologist, you know, that, you know, that doctor is doing research in, in this kind of device and figuring out how it works in patients. Um, and help them in their disorders. So I think there are a lot of applications of technology um, to decide whether to use that kind of more in the neurosurgical realm or neurologic realm. I think, you know, I think is maybe something that you end up deciding when you're going through all those rotations in medical school. And if you get to an OR and you say, aha, these are my people and this is my place, um, that might be the path that you go down. Um, versus me where I went into an OR and I said, oh my God, how do I get out of this thing really fast? <laughs> um, and so I think sometimes it's just experience uh, and kind of getting there. Yeah, I do think neurology and neurosurgery really lend themselves to technology because the brain is ultimately has a lot of like electrical circuits. Um, my background is actually in computational neuroscience. I think a lot of people have interests in the kind of more technology aspect, um, they're definitely, um, so I was actually just speaking to a neurosurgery resident who um, did part of his residency, like he did part of his research at Google. Um, so there's definitely ways that you can always, you know, like work um, in your interests. I agree with Dr. Kurzweil, your day ultimately looks very different if you're a neurosurgeon or a neurologist. And I think there are probably other things that will um, contribute more to that decision than an interest in uh, technology, which I think can really be applied to both. So Eric asks, um, how has your job as a neurologist changed as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, do you see any patients with long COVID, uh, long COVID symptoms? This is for both, um, yeah, for both of, of you guys, if you've noticed any of that. Sure. So COVID probably changed Panina's training a lot. Um, so I'll let her speak to that. Um, for me as a neurologist, uh, yeah, it's a great question. And I have seen a lot of patients who have had neurologic symptoms after COVID infection. And to be honest, now we're seeing patients with neurologic symptoms that we don't know if it's attributed to the COVID vaccine, but might have developed worsening headaches in the setting of the vaccine and things like that, um, though I am totally pro-vaccine. Um, and, and so I think that it definitely has, you know, affected our, um, you know, our practices in that way. We at NYU and I think a lot of institutions, especially around New York City and certainly um, beyond that, we were the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic back in spring of 2020. And that was when we knew nothing about this virus, though we still don't know a lot about it. Um, we knew nothing back then. And so what we've been doing is as we're seeing patients with these kind of post-COVID like symptoms that are neurologic in nature, um, we're collecting data on them. And so we've actually, you know, as a group, we've published data on what we were seeing in the hospitals at the time, the rate of strokes in COVID patients that Dr. Torres saw a lot of, um, and then the rates of office complications of it, headaches or neuropathies or Guillain-Barre and, and other disorders that may or may not have been triggered by the infection or some post-infectious problem. Um, and so we're collecting data still, and we're, we're kind of, we're writing what we see, but we're also continuing to collect data to see if there are kind of long-term um, sequela of the virus. Um, in the moment of the virus, it also changed the day-to-day -day lives of our residents a lot. Instead of practicing just neurology, they were seeing COVID patients. They were, you know, helping with vented patients in ICUs because most of our hospital in spring of 2020 became kind of a COVID center. So their, their training was kind of transformed from that perspective um, and now are also uh, seeing a lot of these kind of post-COVID complications. Um, I would say medical school changed a lot from COVID. Uh, we were actually, I think most medical schools went remote for about three months until proper testing and understanding about proper PPE and the ability to acquire that um, consistently were kind of more in place. And then I think schools felt uh, more safe having students go in. Um, I would say one thing that COVID, I think still kind of affects the hospital is um, visiting. So 
I kind of forget that normally people have often many family members at their bedside and that's now not something that hospitals are allowing. Often it's just very limited um, hours, limited number of people. And I think that that's a challenge to everyone who works in the hospital. And I think that that has really um, allowed me to think about how important it is to, you know, include family members, include, you know, other people who are involved in the patient's care as well. Um, and I think that is something that as a medical student, you'll get a lot of experience doing. So that's something that um, often in a rush might fall to the wayside, um, but is something that's uh, obviously very important to the patients and their families. So I think that it's been a good experience um, in that way. I also, I was doing some remote work in the ICUs during COVID and I saw a lot of neurological complications. And that's when I started noticing that those were maybe the most um, interesting to me were a lot of the kind of neurological sequela of COVID. Um, so definitely, you know, a disease that also impacts the brain in many ways that we're just kind of beginning to understand. Yeah. I think next we'll ask uh, Leslie to go ahead and ask her question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. So I'm currently an undergraduate student aiming to enter medical school, and I was wondering what you would consider to be the most important things to just kind of focus on when first getting involved in clinical experience and talking to patients for the first time. Um, and I was wondering what, what ways have your clinical experiences in like undergraduate or med school prepared you for working with people as a successful neurologist? Yeah, that's a good question, Leslie. So, you know, I think um, in general, one of the, the most important skills to have as a doctor working with patients is simply the ability to listen. And I think that's like seems obvious, but um, we often don't do that. We kind of write our scripts in our head of what we want our patients to kind of fit into. Um, and we and we kind of like make assumptions. Um, whereas when you're first entering medical school and you're at the undergraduate level, you don't really know to have those scripts yet. And so oftentimes you're the best listeners. Um, and so I think it's always important to kind of maintain that and, and make sure that when you're listening to a patient, let them tell you the story. Um, more often than not, they'll give you the answers in their story. Um, you just have to piece those, those kind of puzzle pieces together to, to get the answer. So I think being a, a good listener and kind of helping to develop those skills and honing those skills as you go is, is really important as you go along um, to become a, a successful neurologist. Um, and then I think something that medical schools and residencies really look for in terms of getting people to join their teams um, is to be a team player. And I say that because medicine, you know, we like to say in our department that um, medicine and neurology is kind of like a team sport. You know, you have to um, bounce ideas off each other and run cases by one another and think about how to work together in a team to take care of patients. So it's one doctor will never take full care of a patient. You need a phlebotomist to draw blood. You need an MRI technician to get them in an MRI. You need a physical therapist to help them with their therapy. You need a nurse to administer medications. Um, and I'm simplifying everyone's roles. I mean, there are so, so many important roles that these different people have. Um, but my point is that when you're entering the field of medicine and certainly medical school, I think, I think schools are really looking for people who are kind of willing to be a really contributory member, um, but also a good player within that team um, and get along with other people. So those would be the two biggest things I, I would emphasize as like someone kind of trying to go through the process and, you know, in your applications and things like that, any, any kind of activities and things that you've been involved in that highlight those skills, um, I think are things you should certainly highlight in your applications. I think this is a great question. Um, I would say one of the main things I got from my clinical experiences that I had in undergrad was mentors. And I think that that's going back to this, something Dr. Kurzweil mentioned. I think really, you know, there are many things that you could gain clinically from these experiences. Ultimately, you'll see lots of patients and you'll get lots of training and how to interact with them. And there, it's never too early, but I think it's important to think about what will be helpful to you um, 
in choosing your path. And so I think, you know, thinking about gaining mentors, um, following, like I still have mentors from people that I shadowed as a undergrad. Um, and there's still people who inspire me to, you know, continue on this path. So I think that that's something that I would stress. Um, the other thing I would say is just kind of seeing different clinical settings. Um, I feel like we kind of know from being a patient ourselves, um, some of what medicine looks like, but medicine is so broad, uh, neurology as well. And so I think, you know, getting to see what different settings like in the hospital, in a clinic, um, you know, looking at procedures, things like that, um, I think is also really helpful. In terms of kind of skills, I would say the, I remember learning, you know, I think a lot of the things we focus on when we first start is the, the knowledge, like all the information. Um, and I think as Dr. Kurzweil mentioned, a major part of medicine is actually focusing on the person and what they're actually asking, what they actually want from you um, and how they're responding to what you're saying. Because ultimately, you know, whether they take their medications, whether they go to physical therapy, that's going to depend on a lot on how you explain things in your relationship with your patients. And so I think just gaining those experiences of making, you know, relationships with patients, talking to them, understanding what it's like to you know, to have their conditions um, is something that is also really useful. In terms of what medical schools are looking for, I don't, I think that an interest in medicine is definitely something they're looking for. I think that a lot of people do shadowing, myself included. Um, ultimately, I think you, I, I don't think those are necessary, um, but I do think that they're helpful for you to understand kind of what you're getting what, you, what you're choosing to do. Um, so that's what I would kind of stress is, you know, maybe at this point, think about what would be most helpful for you to kind of see for yourself. We have a question asking um, to explain the difference between pediatric and adult neurology and the different tracks that are available. Sure. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there are, um, they are different residency training programs, child neurology and adult neurology. And so it's really through the medical school process that you decide, I love neurology, but my people are the smaller people and the people who are younger. Um, and all, you know, I would take care of people all the way from infancy through adolescence. Um, or you learn that your people are really the adult neurologists and, uh, or sorry, are the adult patients um, and that you want to treat kind of adult disorders. And I think that that's a really hard um, distinction to make until you get to medical school and kind of see the difference in the patient population and the types of disorders that you'll ultimately treat. Um, because in, you know, just from my experience going through it in child neurology, um, it's, you see a lot of developmental disorders, you see a lot of seizure disorders, um, you see as, as adolescents get old, you know, as uh, patients get older and they go into adolescence, you might um, see more headache disorders emerge, you see a lot of concussion, things like that. Um, and so if, if that is what interests you, um, and again, a lot of times you find that out in medical school, it might be pediatric neurology that you pursue. Um, in terms of the training and the tracks, um, you would apply to a pediatric neurology program separately through application process than adult. And in adult, you apply all at the same time for one year of internal medicine training and then three years of neurology training. Many programs are combined in that they offer the one year of medicine with the three years of neurology, but not every program is like that. Sometimes you have to apply separately to a year of medicine versus three years of neurology. In child neurology, um, most programs you apply to one program and you do all of your training at that program. And that training consists of two years of general pediatrics followed by neurology training, which is three total years. And those three total years are typically separated as one year of adult neurology and two years of child neurology. So child neurology training is actually a total of five years versus adult neurology, which is a total of four years. Um, 
And I don't know why that is. I think it's probably because in order to be a pediatric neurologist, like I said, a lot of the issues you end up seeing are developmental. So in order to understand the pathology with development, you really have to good, get a good handle on what normal development is like. Um, and you do that through kind of general pediatric training. So those are kind of the two. And then neurosurgery, although that was not asked in the question, I mentioned earlier that that's even a separate residency training program. Most neurosurgical programs are about seven years of training. It's a really long training program. Um, and that is a totally separate residency that you apply to in which the first year is made up of general surgery and other surgical subspecialties, followed by the remainder of your training in, in neurosurgery. And I think, I, I don't know for sure, but I think most training programs, you do all of those years in one, in one place. Yeah, um, I think this just brings up for me, um, I think it's a people in my year, so I'm applying in September, have still not decided what they're applying into. And I think it's just important to stress that you know, you'll see things throughout your uh, training that will, you know, you'll be like, I like that, I like that. You'll go back to things. And I think, you know, your experiences is what ultimately will shape, you know, your own understanding of what you find fulfilling um, and what you enjoy doing every day. Um, so that's just my little plug for not being too stressed too early about knowing where exactly you're going, um, which I know is hard because none of us like uncertainty. But I, I do think that it's important to know that even people three years into medical school are still deciding. And that's okay. We have a question from uh, Renjith who uh, wants to know about research. I'll just go ahead and ask for him. Um, he wanted to know whether um, you can publish uh, during your career, during medical school residency, and what the process behind that is. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, you can certainly kind of explore the world of research at any stage of your training um, from the undergraduate level through you know, medical school through residency and, and beyond. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, there are different ways to do that, um, that you can incorporate research into your career. Um, in training, we really encourage it and we usually encourage it um, at any point that, that you feel you're able to give time. Most of that translates to what we call elective time. So, you know, when you get to um, medical school, um, and residency training, you'll have periods of two weeks, a month, a few months where you get to choose what you want to do. And people will choose that they might want to do additional rotations to see a certain subspecialty of medicine, or they might choose a research kind of elective and you end up pursuing your research project um, alongside mentors um, in that time. So those, those elective periods are really crucial, I think, for undergraduate medical school and residency training um, to utilize for research. And then beyond, you know, as a faculty member, as a, an attending neurologist, um, you really kind of ultimately shape your career how you want it. And I'll also urge that how you start a career is maybe not how your career will go, right? And so you might start off seeing a whole lot of patients and then over time you have a lot of questions about those patients and you wanna explore them and you wanna answer them through research. And so your career may develop in a way such that you have more research time as you go along. Um, and that maybe you'll even work in a lab or maybe you'll do clinical research. Um, so what you start off in your career might not be where you end up, but you can incorporate incorporate research in many different ways um, in, in your in your career. And then, it, you know, in terms of publications, I think I, I saw a snippet about publications. Um, you know, neurology is an incredible publication and the AAN actually has several publications kind of um, that it's affiliated with and all of their publications are really wide read and, re and reach like a really large um, population um, and have a really large impact factor. Um, and so uh, there you can read about all their publications um, on their web on the AAM website. And one in particular that I'm really fond of because I'm a residency training director is that there's a residency 
and fellows section of, um, of the AAN and also of a lot of the journals like neurology. And in this section, it's really geared towards residents and fellows publishing what they're seeing. Are they seeing case reports? Are they doing their own research? Um, are they publishing really cool images that they're seeing? Um, or maybe they're working on some education research uh, project. There's an education research section there. Um, and so I would, you know, I would encourage you if you're doing research and you're at different stages in your career, kind of explore all the different uh, publications and the different sections that are in those publications to see if maybe your stage of training has a, a really appropriate section um, for you to publish in or for you to uh, at least submit to. Um, and there are several other journals out there that are like that as well that have kind of uh, trainee specific sections that you can look into. Yeah, I would just add that there are also conferences that have specific programming for people at different stages like undergrads, medical students. Um, and I found those really helpful as I was just kind of seeing the type of research that's done, kind of the options, um, and getting some mentoring on that. We have Leslie with another question. I had a question on uh, whether you could discuss um, if there was any intersection between your work and integrative medicine, such as like progressive muscle relaxation or biofeedback, would you ever recommend these to any of your patients? Yeah, it's a good question, Leslie. I think in neurology, we see a really large kind of gamut of patients with different disorders, many of them including pain disorders. Um, migraine syndromes, a lot of different disorders that would be amenable to kind of a more holistic or kind of multidisciplinary type of approach to their treatment. Um, so I, um, I, as a neurologist, and I think many of my neurology colleagues, if not all of the ones that I'm thinking of right now, are very open to um, multiple different approaches to treating patients in a very like holistic and integrative way. And so like as an example, you know, one of the patients I saw this morning has horrible spinal stenosis and has already gone for, you know, all the tests to, to work that up, an electrical test of the nerves, um, an MRI of the lumbar spine and so forth. Um, and now we're really focusing on kind of treatment regime and regimen. And, you know, one of the treatment modalities that I referred my patients for was acupuncture. Um, and I think that I would probably include that kind of in that integrative medicine kind of category. Um, and uh, a lot of patients with migraines actually do quite well with things like biofeedback that's performed by psychologists. So a major part of, um, of medicine and neurology I mentioned earlier is like kind of being a team player. And that's not just being a team player with your, your colleagues in neurology, that's also your colleagues in other fields. And so, you know, part of why I think I can be successful in, in, in helping my patients get better is because I have buddies in all these different fields. I have buddy therapists and I have my go-to to acupuncturists and I have my go-to colleagues in stroke neurology when I have a really like complicated stroke case and I need Dr. Torres to help me with that um, and, and so forth. So I think utilizing all those different services are our, our PM&R doctors. Um, you know, you talked about PM&R as progressive muscle relaxation. The first thing I thought was my colleagues in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Um, and that's another field of medicine, physiatry. We have a lot of overlap and I'll often refer my patients for different pain injections to them. Um, some of them do acupuncture, some of them do other, other types of injections. So we really utilize all, all different kinds of services. And I think there's a huge place for holistic and integrative medicine and neurology. All right, I guess uh, we have a couple minutes left. Uh, if no one else has questions, uh, let me just ask uh, Ariel uh, or Dr. Kurzweil uh, and and Benina, what what are your favorite things uh, about what you're doing right now? Uh, what is your favorite part of the day uh, at work or school? Mm, my favorite parts of the day. So I. I mean, I love seeing patients. That's why I got into this field. That's why I'm in neurology. So seeing patients and thinking about all the like, you know, 
new and different types of things I'm going to see always excites me. Even if it's a follow-up patient, just seeing that patient, how's your family doing and what's going on? I had a follow-up patient today with a totally new neurologic disorder. So, you know, it was a kind of a follow-up turned into something really new and interesting. Um, so, you know, my favorite day, uh, my favorite parts of the day always somehow involve, involve patients, um, but also seeing my colleagues. I mean, I, uh, you know, this is, this is probably a plug for NYU, but my colleagues at NYU are incredible. And so just going to work and saying, oh, I'm, re- I'm going to a place where I love the people who I work um, with is, is really amazing that you could say that. But I would say kind of broadly in neurology, kind of as a plug for more neurology in general, um, it really attracts people who love the substrate of neurology and are really genuinely intellectually curious about what's happening with the brain and the nervous system, but also genuinely want to help people. And I think the combination of those two things is like absolutely incredible um, and produces neurologists. And so that would kind of be my plug that like my, a great thing about my day is seeing my colleagues and, and really hanging out with my colleagues. And Dr. Torres and I were at kind of at a gathering last night celebrating one of our colleagues. And I think that that's, you know, that's the most fun part when you really feel like you can connect with these people because you have all these shared passions. Um, so right now I'm in the hospital. I'm on a like rotation where I'm in the ICU actually. So the intensive care unit. And definitely my favorite part of my day right now is pre-rounding. So when you start in um, inpatient medicine, often you go see the patients by yourself in the morning, check up on them, see what happened overnight. Um, and then you round as a team. Um, so I find pre-rounding, I really, I've always enjoyed pre-rounding. It's like your time where it's just you and your patient. Um, and you know, they've, sometimes just woken up and they have a lot to share. And I think that, you know, that's kind of a time where you're able to build relationships with patients um, as a medical student or resident. That's like kind of when you get to see them by yourself. Um, so I would say that's currently my favorite. I also agree that, you know, I'm, for instance, we just switched teams today. I'm still there, but my residents are different. And I am always, amazed at how quickly teams work together. Um, and I think a lot of that is just the shared you know, goal of helping people um, doing what they can, you know? Um, and I think that's always, I think like my favorite part of medicine is that you're always with people who, you know, care and are incredibly smart, incredibly interested in what they're doing. Um, I think this applies to neurology in particular as well. Um, I think it's just like a great atmosphere to be in. So I would say that. One last question um, from Shai. He's wondering um, if you have any advice for um, students that are outside of the US and uh, want to study in the US. So for medical school, is that what we're saying? So um, there are people in my class who are not from the US. It's definitely doable. Um, I think often what they did was they worked in the US for a little bit before they did medical school. So they were applying from within the US. I don't know whether that's actually necessary, but that's kind of what I've seen from my classmates. Um, so whether that's you know like doing research for a year um, doing some sort of fellowship or, you know, any sort of activity kind of in the U.S. I think it just gives you a stronger reason for saying this is where I want to live um, to the medical schools. Um, so that would be my only kind of, yeah, suggestion I have. Yeah, I'd agree with Panina that I think the most important part is experience and showing that there is a reason that you want to practice and it's because you have experience um, doing something in the U.S. and you say, I want to practice healthcare within that system um, because it's probably very different than healthcare systems um, in other parts of the world, I can imagine. And I think, you know, in terms of the, on the residency training side, because I'm, I'm kind of beyond the medical school and I look at medical students who are from various places, including foreign medical graduate schools. And I think it 
certainly, like Panina said, those students can absolutely be considered for positions in US training programs and, and are and make up a great portion of them. Um, I think that in the application, there should be some kind of um, hint as to you know, your connection with the US, like Panina mentioned. And so um, some type of experience, whether that be research experience, and then while you were doing research, you kind of learned more about the US healthcare system, um, or some kind of observer uh, observership, um, or some kind of connection to maybe a physician that you know, or someone in the family or some friend that is in the US, um, and has talked to you about their experiences. So I think that kind of connection is, is not necessary, but certainly important in just a making making sure that that's really what you want to do, that you want to practice here in the U.S., um, and then B, letting programs know that that's something you're serious about. All right. I think we've uh, reached uh, the end of our session. Um, so thank you to Dr. Kurzweil and future Dr. Krieger. Um, for their insights and time today. Um, and thank you to the students for joining. Um, and you'll receive a, or see a brief uh, survey pop up at the end of the session. Um, so uh, please uh, fill it out for us so that we can improve these sessions uh, in the program as uh, we go through. Um, and then any follow-up questions you might have about the program or the AAN and the resources, please contact um, Brady uh, Malega. Um, and you will see the email pop up uh, in the chat box. So thank you, everyone. And again, Dr. Uh, Kurzweil and future Dr. Krieger. Yes. Thanks. Oh, Thanks so Dr. Much. Kurzweil. Yes, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Torres, as well. You were a wonderful helping hand in this. Um, this webinar was recorded. Once edited, the recording will be available on AAN.com, and so we will let you know. But look for information on AAN social media channels for upcoming guest neurologist webinars. And thank you all again for joining the guest neurologist session. Um, again, we ask that you fill out the short survey and um, have a great day. Thanks so much for having us. Everyone. Thanks.